Hi everyone, really good to be back with you again this week. Uh, I'm continuing through our series on Psalm 40. Last time I preached on delighting in the mercy of God and what I'm going to share today follows on from that. So this week we're in Psalm 40 verses 13 to 16, just three short verses. If you've got your Bible, please follow along. I'm just going to begin by reading that scripture to you. David continues with Psalm 40 by saying this from verse 13. Uh, be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let those be put to shame and disappointed altogether who seek to snatch away my life. Let those be turned back and brought to dishonour who delight in my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, aha, aha. What's going on here? Well, remember the context of this, what comes before verse 13 is King David is saying that he is encompassed by evils. He is surrounded by people who are seeking his hurt and he's exercising faith in his God to deliver him and to deal with his enemies. And for David, that's a good thing. David said in Psalm chapter 20, some people trust in chariots and some people trust in horses but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Uh, those people who were surrounding David, the godless nations, uh, they didn't trust in the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob to win their battles. They trusted in their own might and power. David was different in that regard. He, he trusted in God to deliver him and many times God did and he trusted in God to deal with his enemies. And it says in Hebrews 11, chapter 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And in David's context, that was the exercise of his faith, not to trust in his own military might, but to trust in God, to trust that God was for him. You know, our lives are all unique and we've all got different opportunities to exercise faith. In David's context, that was the right way for him to exercise faith. But uh, our lives aren't all the same. We're not all surrounded by enemies like David is in, in, in a military sense. But it might be in our um, job situation. It might be we're looking for a job or it might be in living righteously in our job uh, or choosing what job we're going to do so that that's a righteous choice that we exercise faith. That Maybe we don't go down an easier route, but we go down a harder route uh, because it's a route that more honours God. Uh, there are people in our church who've got illnesses and sickness. Uh, in their context, they're exercising faith that God would heal and Jesus would be sufficient for them during their time of struggle. Uh, that goes for those of us who maybe are uh, in relationships and uh, exercising faith that we would live righteously in those or, or seeking a partner and exercising faith in living in purity before we get married. Uh, for some of us, our faith is in, excess, is in uh, raising our children, that we raise them in the right way. For others, it might be in going out and doing evangelism. We're trusting God to save. We're trusting God to heal. We're trusting God to work wonders, not by our skill, not by our um, ability to um, preach an eloquent message, but by the power of the Lord. Uh, David trusted God to put away earthly enemies. That's commendable uh, according to the understanding David had about God. But the, the kind of prayer that David prayed here in these three verses, where he prayed that people who were surrounding him would be put to shame and disappointed and be brought to dishonour and that they would be appalled, uh, it's, got a, it's got a certain name. And, and the name for that is an imprecatory prayer. It's a, it's a technical name, an imprecatory prayer. And it comes from the Latin word meaning to invoke. Uh, so these are prayers where David is calling for God's judgment on his enemies. There are 14 major imprecatory prayers in the book of Psalms. This one is what I would call um, a light imprecatory prayer. That's just my term for it. Um, because David's calling for shame, he's calling for disappointment, and he's calling for dishonour to fall from heaven on his enemies. Um, I'm calling it light because he could pray for much worse judgment. And in other Psalms he does, he, he calls for the complete destruction of his enemies. 
uh, sort of call for shame and disappointment and dishonor is kind of light by comparison, but it's still an imprecatory prayer. He's still invoking his God to bring down calamity on those who are opposing him. I want to pose a question today when we think about this kind of prayer and then answer it. Um, and the question is this, uh, should we as Christians be imitating David and praying like this when we're faced with an unrighteous enemy? Should we pr be praying these imprecatory prayers when people are coming against us? Whatever context that's in, again, whether it's in our job, our relationships, uh, our social situations, or maybe next door neighbours, or um, it could be even when we're out doing evangelism, should we be praying prayers like David did? There's debate over this. There's a difference in opinion. Some people would say, well, yes, if it's in the Psalms, and uh, we use the Psalms, we use the Psalter as uh, our prayer book book and it and we believe all scripture is authoritative then yes we can take those prayers we can make them our own and we can pray them uh, i believe that that's too simplistic of you it's a it's a view that's really without nuance uh, believing in the authority of scripture as a christian doesn't mean that you read the bible in a flat way uh, and what i mean by that is that if it's there in black and white we just accept it, regardless of what genre of writing it's in, regardless of what the context is, regardless of where it occurs in the Bible narrative, we just accept it. That's that's too simplistic, and that's not necessarily what we mean by saying that the scriptures are authoritative. You have to understand that the Bible is actually a progressive revelation, in that we see Jesus in the New Testament helping us to reinterpret the Old Testament. When I say it's a progressive revelation, what I don't mean is that it changes with the culture throughout all the ages. So if the culture ex accepts something in 2024 uh, that is counter to the Bible, that we change the Bible and embrace it, that's not what I mean by progressive. Sometimes the term progressive is used in that sense. What I mean by it's a progressive revelation is that as you go through scripture, scripture reinterpret, reinterprets scripture. And we see Jesus doing that uh, in, the, in the New Testament, reinterpreting the Old. Jesus comes along and he says, look, I've not come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've not come to do away with what we find in the Old Testament. But what he does do is he fulfills it and he reveals the heart behind what is written in the Old Testament. Even if the people in the Old Testament didn't have full rev revelation on the heart behind it, Jesus comes and he brings that to us. And he changes the way that we're supposed to live today so that we look even more like God when we live out his commands. So we have this advantage, and the New Testament even says this, we have this advantage over the Old Testament saints because of the time that we live in, because we live post the incarnation of Jesus, post the revelation that Jesus brought with his teachings about the kingdom of God. We have that advantage that we can really um, see God's intention in the scriptures in a in a more um, enlightened way so we see this reinterpretation by Jesus a lot in the Sermon on the Mount uh, where you might remember Jesus often says phrases like this he says you've heard that it was said but I say to you right you've heard that it was said this is what you've heard from the Old Testament this is what you've heard from your tradition this is what you've heard from your rabbis this is what you understand to be the ways of God. But I, as the son of God, I'm saying to you, this is what it really means. And this is how you should live. We also see um, Jesus rebuking his own disciples when they sought to mirror some of King David's behavior. Now, remember, King David uh, is hailed as the greatest king, aside from Jesus, that has ever been over Israel, he was the hero of the disciples. Even today, if you speak to Jewish people, um, they will hail King David as the greatest ruler over Israel who's ever lived. So the disciples would have known the Psalms, they would have known the prayers of David, and they would have known his military conquests, and they would have assumed it was completely righteous to imitate them. Do you remember James and John? 
um, wanting to call down fire on a Samaritan village because Jesus came and they didn't receive Jesus. And they said, right, well, Jesus, should we call down judgment on them? They believed they were doing a righteous thing. Maybe they would have been copying David and his conquests. And what does Jesus do? He turns and rebukes them. And he says, no, that is not the way we go. Uh, we also see in Luke 22, at Jesus' arrest, a servant of, um, a disciple of Jesus struck the servant of the high priest with a sword. And he was doing that in defense of Jesus. And he probably thought he was doing a good thing. I'm, I'm defending the son of God. I'm defending the king. Jesus turned around and he said, no more of this. And he touched the ear of the guy who'd had his ear cut off and he healed him. He healed the servant of the high priest who was coming to get Jesus arrested and lead to his death. What mercy. So throughout Jesus' ministry, we see that he comes to reveal a kingdom that is somewhat different to the rule of Israel in the Old Testament. It's a kingdom that is just not of this world. It's a kingdom of joy and peace and righteousness. And Jesus reveals it by reinterpreting Old Testament examples and behaviours. It's really important for us to see that, especially in a day and age where there's well and especially in america there's quite a lot of christian nationalism and we in the uk can be influenced a lot by america and lots of people would um copy the prayers of the old testament in defense of their own nation believing that actually god's will is to defend their nation against their enemies and calling down judgment and curses on other nations uh, jesus comes along and he says that's not of my kingdom that's not the way we should go and then we see Jesus coming and revealing this new way, not only by um, his teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, not this but that, not only by rebuking his disciples and changing their thinking, but also through his own witness, which is the most powerful way, of course. Um, not seeking to destroy his enemies, but voluntarily suffering under their attacks against him and then praying for his Father in heaven to forgive them as he even hung bleeding and dying on a cross. So why didn't Jesus fight in the way that David fought? And why didn't he pray in the way that David prayed? Why didn't he pray an imprecatory prayer, calling down judgment and confusion and dishonor and shame on his enemies, but instead um, pleading for their forgiveness? Why did he choose to suffer rather than fight? Why did he pray blessing on his enemies rather than judgment and cursing? Well, the Apostle Paul reveals the answer to that in Ephesians 6, uh, where Paul says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You see, our fight as kingdom people is not against those who are seeking to do us harm. It's against the powers of darkness that are controlling those people. As a Christian, you go from having this understanding that the people who are trying to hurt you are the ones who are to be defeated, and your 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 fight throughout your whole life is against people like that, to understanding actually the fight is a it's a spiritual fight. It's not a flesh and blood fight. The people who come against you likely uh, don't believe in these powers and they don't know they're a vessel of these powers. But those powers are real and they always come at us through people. They manifest through the, the gossip and the slander and the accusation and the, the criticism and the manipulation and even physical violence we might face from people. And their aim all the way along is to get us to abandon the faith to, to provoke us to a point where we cast off the meekness and the gentleness of Jesus and we step back into the world in which we used to live before and we fight fire with fire. But Jesus says, no, I won't have my followers living like that. So how do we deal with people who set themselves up as our enemies? Well, Jesus addresses that in the Sermon on the Mount. And I taught on this about five years ago. And I'm just going to share some principles with you today from that teaching. Because many of you who are in our church weren't in our church then. And for those who were, um, this is so central to 
living out the gospel, we need to be reminded. Uh, so Matthew uh, 5, uh, 43 to 44 in the Sermon on the Mount. And, and here's this phrase that I mentioned before. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You've heard it said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I say to you, I bring a different teaching to you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna change your thinking here, says Jesus. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. He then lays out what should motivate us to love our enemies. He says, so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust. That's the reason that we're to love and we're to pray. And when he's calling us to pray, he's not calling us to pray prayers of judgment and prayers of cursing. He's calling us to pray prayers of blessing in the same way he did to imitate him. He says, do that so that you'll be sons of your father. But what's he saying? Well, if you're the son of your father, you reflect your father. You are the glory of your father. Um, you know, I've, I've often said before, people will see my son Reuben and say, oh, I see you in him. He, he, he looks like you. Sometimes he speaks like you. <laughs> that could be for better or for worse because I'm a fallen human being. It's not always good. But when we're reflecting God, um, it should be good. We should shine forth the glory of God. And, and Jesus is saying, uh, when you treat your enemies in this way, you your sons of your father, you're reflecting your father who's in heaven. You're, you're displaying the invisible God to the earth. You see, the Bible says that no one has ever seen God. And so how does the world get a glimpse of the invisible God? Because it, it needs a glimpse. It needs to see who this God is. Well, first of all, in Christ, when he walked on the earth, uh, Colossians 1.15 Paul said that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Uh, so it, in the way that Jesus uh, walked, talked, acted, loved, was sacrificial, he's you know full of mercy and grace. He is the image of, of God in heaven. Uh, remember that Philip said to Jesus in uh, John 14, uh, Jesus shows the Father. And Jesus says, Philip, I've been with you all this long and you're asking to see the Father. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen him. I reflect who the invisible God is. Uh, but the beautiful thing with the, the Christian story is that Jesus says, it's better that I go to heaven and send the spirit, that the spirit of God, that I may come and dwell in you. And that Jesus dwelling in us would display the Father in us. The Father in Christ and Christ in us. See, Jesus says again in John 14, 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. And we, Jesus and the father, will come to him and make our home with him. We display Christ as he resides in us. So we're living as sons of God when we reflect the father. The world should see God in us, not just hear about God from us. And as followers of Jesus, living to reflect God should be right up there on the top of our list of life goals, along with loving him with all of our heart and loving our neighbour as ourself. We should want to live like him and reflect him. Now, how does this fit in with enemy love? Well, enemy love is one of the most powerful and evident displays of God. In what way does the invisible God love his enemies? Well, it says in verse 45 of Matthew 5 that he makes the sun rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. Um, the, the term for that kind of love towards the whole of mankind is called common grace. It's the grace of God that is common because it is showered upon every person regardless of whether they love God or hate him regardless of whether they spend their day praying or ignoring him he sends rain on them he sends sun on them he gives them food he gives them produce whether that's Stalin who 
on his deathbed still raised his fist in defiance against God, or whether it's you and me who, before we came to Christ, used to live as enemies of God, he still showered his grace upon us. And that aspect of God's love is unconditional upon response. It, it shows the magnitude of God's grace to all mankind, because if you've not acknowledged God, he's still loving you. He's not refusing to love you because you don't follow him. He's still sending the sun. He's still sending the rain. He's still loving you every day. And of course, Jesus then reflected that common grace and that love by dying for his enemies. For God so loved the whole world that he sent his only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Um, but Jesus not only died for his enemies, but he prayed for them. Uh, you know, Jesus prayed for his disciples and he prayed for those who would become his disciples. Whilst they were still walking away from God, Jesus prayed for us um, before we loved him. So we reflect the death of Christ as we love our enemies, as we choose not to pray prayers of judgment on them, but to pray prayers of blessing, even when they're seeking our harm. And there are some specific ways that that reflects the death of Christ. Enemy love requires detachment from self. Like for you to be able to pray blessing on someone who's seeking your harm requires you to be completely detached from living for you. It, it requires death to self. And the Bible says that when we come to Jesus, we die to ourselves. When we go into the waters of baptism, it's, it's a representation that we are dead and we live to him we live for him we don't live for ourselves or for our own good anymore um we we live for jesus um so to be able to love our enemies we can't be controlled by how their behavior is affecting us we have to be controlled by the love of jesus in us and that's a way a Christian should live every day. We're controlled by his love in us, by what's best for him, what's best for the glory of God, not what is best for us. And when we love our enemies, we reflect Christ and specifically the death of Christ, the, the greatest sacrificial act that's ever been in the history of the world. Uh, because we're loving God in such a way where our, our sole reason for living is to do his will. Uh, remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane uh, as he was going to the cross. He wasn't looking forward to it. He was saying, Father, if there's another way, can we go that way? Can can you take this cup from me? He says, but not my will, but your will be done. And in that moment, we see Jesus putting to death his own desires in order to live for the will of the Father. And in order to love our enemies, we have to be able to do that. It, we, we're putting to death what we want to do. We're putting to death defending ourselves. We're putting to death getting our own back. Uh, we're, we're putting to death the desire to be victorious in this age. And we're saying, not my will, Father, but your will. And we know his will is that we love our enemies and we pray for our enemies and we bless our enemies. And then Jesus says, look, if you're doing this, uh, you're going to be different to the whole world that's around you. And of course, we want to be different, don't we? We want to be set apart. Sometimes we we have these moments in our lives where we realise, look, I don't actually look that different from my neighbour and there's something wrong there. You know, Christians should look very different from their neighbours. Well, Jesus says this in Matthew 5, 46 and 47. He says, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Jesus is saying, look, when you when you just love people who love you, you're, you're just doing what the world does. But when you love your enemies, you're showing that you're of a completely different world, a completely different kingdom. Jesus said in John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world my kingdom is otherworldly and to love and pray for our enemies friends is otherworldly the tax collectors and the gentiles that jesus talks about there they were seen as the worst of the worst by the jews and jesus is saying look even the people that you see as the most pagan um 
heathen, carnal people in the world, even they love people who love them. <laughs> even Hitler loved those who loved him. Even King Jong-un loves those who love him. The worst genocidal maniacs in the world love people who love them. So when you love people who love you, maybe other Christians or, or neighbours who are kind to you, you're not doing anything different from the whole world. You're not being set apart. There are many generous and kind people in the world who aren't Christians. You'll have friends, you'll have family, you'll have neighbours who aren't followers of Christ, but are still kind and generous to those who love them. But they don't love their enemies. Enemy love totally sets us apart as a kingdom people. To pray for someone who's hurting you completely sets you apart. And that has to be a great motivation for you, to be a light in the world, to be holy and set apart. How can you be holy? Love your enemies. Pray for people who are doing bad to you. Don't call down curses on them. Call down blessing. There's another motivator for us, beyond reflecting God and being set apart in the world, another motivator for us to love our enemies. Jesus says in verse 46, that if we only love those who love us, we won't get our reward. That suggests that if we love those who are our enemies and we pray for them, we will get a reward. There's a reward that's waiting for us. What kind of reward? An eternal reward. The Bible is full of pointers towards eternal rewards in heaven. Some people think that when we get to heaven, everyone's just going to be equal. And it's kind of like this This. So Christians push equality to the nth degree where it's like we all have to be kind of almost like robots, all the same, where there's no differences. The Bible says there are differences in this life. There are differences in gifts and in abilities. And it says there'll be differences in heaven. There'll be differences in the degrees of reward that we get. Um, in Matthew 25, 21, Jesus says, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. That is in context of the age to come. How faithful you've been in this life directly equates to what you will have responsibility over in the kingdom of God in the age to come. In the kingdom of God in the age to come, we'll be worshipping him, but we'll be working as well. And we will have responsibilities. And those who've been faithful in this life will have more responsibilities than those who haven't been faithful. There will be people who, when I say haven't been faithful, there will be people who have believed in Jesus, but they've not been as faithful with what Jesus has given them as others have. They'll still be in the kingdom of heaven, but they will not have the reward that those who've been incredibly faithful will have. And there will be great joy for those who are given great responsibility in the age to come. Again, that should be a motivating factor for you in how you live in this age. Um, often we think of faithful ser the, the kind of faithful servanthood that brings reward as being the size of our ministry or the impact of our ministry or our ministry's reach. Um, that's not the case. That, that there will be a reward for faithfulness in ministry, and I think we see that by uh, scriptures like the parable of the talents. But it won't be determined by how big your ministry is, but by what you did with what God gave you. Because again, we don't all start equal. Some people start with ten talents, some five, some one, and how you multiply those will be a determinant factor in the reward you get. But I sense the most significant measuring stick of our eternal rewards will simply be in how we mirrored Jesus' character. Aside from what ministry we did, how we mirrored his character. And uh, loving our enemies and praying for them is central to that. Uh, when you're tempted to fight evil with evil or reviling with reviling, think on the forfeit of your eternal reward that will occur if you do that. And realize that if you fight fire with fire, um, you're not just hurting another person who you're supposed to love, but you're hurting yourself. Because you're suffering eternal loss when you do that. Or think on the increase of your eternal reward in a positive sense, 
if you put to death your flesh and you choose to pray blessing and you choose to love rather than calling down cursing and judgment on that person. Jesus then summarizes this teaching on loving and praying for your enemies in verse 48 of Matthew 5. He says, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. <laughs> that seems like a real burden, doesn't it? How can we be perfect like our heavenly father is perfect? Well, let me just lighten that burden a little bit for you. The, the word perfect in the original languages uh, doesn't mean without sin. Okay, It doesn't mean complete perfection where you never mess up, you never screw up. Uh, but it means to be mature in love. It means to walk in the fullness of love. It means to be complete in loving in the same way that God loves. To be full of the love that God possesses. He says, is that possible for me? Well, it is. Ephesians 3 says that it is. Paul prayed for the church at Ephesus. And this is one of the prayers I pray most often for you as members of our church and for myself and my family. Paul says this in Ephesians 14 to 19, Ephesians 3, 14 to 19. He says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth is named in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. You get that? That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The Bible always teaches that what's within us flows out of us. It's always internal to external. It's not external to internal. It's in to out. When the fullness of God's love is in us, we love unconditionally in the same way that God loves unconditionally. Meaning our love and our prayers for people is not no longer dependent on how they treat us. It's not controlled by how they treat us. That's an indifference to us. We love perfectly and we love maturely when we pray for love and for blessing and for good on our enemies. Because that's what Jesus does. And that's God's heart and his will. So all that being said, just to cycle back around to the original question, is it right that as Christians, as followers and imitators of Christ, we pray and precatory prayers because we find them in the Psalms? My answer to that is no, it's not right. Um, David, according to the revelation he had at his time, prayed those prayers and that was an exercise of faith for David in comparison to the world around him. But as we live now in an age where we have a revelation of the kingdom of God through uh, the life and the teaching of Jesus, we can be even more mature in love and we can come to the place where we recognise that the will of God is for the good of the whole of mankind, not just for one nation or for our nation, but for all people. And we become most like him when we love and we pray for our enemies. Our life goal should be to become like God in our character. We do that through seeing the life of Jesus and seeking to imitate him as we exercise faith in him. The goal of our church at Gateway is to make disciples who love God and who love like God. To love like God, we have to love our enemies. When we love our enemies, we're loving like him. We're walking in the fullness of love. Um, I've been convicted over the years that for many Christians, we've become content with being civil to those in our church, even those that we find difficult. We think if we're being civil and not having an issue with them, we're doing well. We've become content with being civil towards our neighbours. Uh, but the bar for us is so much higher than civility. Uh, the, the, the bar is to love like God loves and he will accept nothing else from his followers. Um, 
as I'm teaching this, you might be picturing, and I hope you are, you're picturing people in your life that have been difficult, maybe people who are being difficult, uh, people who have been long-standing enemies, people with whom you've had a very cold relationship. And you might be thinking to yourself, this just seems impossible. Like, how, how on earth am I supposed to love people who've done this to me or to my loved ones? Um, and I just want to say to you, it, it is impossible. You, you can't do it on your own. Uh, you need the Holy Spirit and that's why we need Jesus but with the grace of God with the Holy Spirit filling you every day you can love in the same way he loves and you can be a walking miracle and that's his plan for your life uh, let's pray together because we need God's help but if we pray and we seek him and we draw close to him he'll draw close to us and he'll give us the Holy Spirit so let's pray together Father, we thank you for the revelation we have in Jesus of how you want us to live. Father, we confess that it's impossible for us to love like you, to live like him, uh, without your divine assistance, without a change of heart in the inner being, and without being able to daily sacrifice ourselves to be a living sacrifice in our worship to you. Father, I'm, I'm convinced that when we love our enemies and we pray for them, you take that as worship to you. Uh, Father, help us where we struggle in this area. Wherever there's been anger or bitterness or, or hatred that's grown up through the years, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that your love in us would just douse that fire and cause us to live in peace. Father, I pray, I pray for those of us who've been brought up generationally to um, curse and to do harm to those who do harm to us. And Lord, in the name of Jesus, we cut off any generational curses, uh, any generational habits that are causing us to live like that, to think like that. We pray for a renewal of the mind in Jesus. We pray, Lord, for a new way of living to go down through the generations, a way of living, Lord, that displays you and your kingdom. Lord, I pray that we would not just be known for our preaching, but be known for our love and be known for how we bless those who hate us. That we will be known as ones who genuinely reflect Jesus and who is set apart in the world. Uh, Father, help apply this to our lives. Show us, Lord, where we need to repent and believe. And I pray that as we gather in our groups, you'd help us be open and vulnerable with each other to bring things into the light that you may have your way in our lives. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you. Enjoy gathering together in your groups. I pray that it's a really fruitful time. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.